welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening around the world, and a warm welcome to our spotlight special at the Global Design Thinking Alliance. My name is Uli Weinberg, and I'm the director of the HBI School of Design Thinking, the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam in Germany. And I'm also the president of the Global Design Thinking Alliance, the GDTA. And I will have the pleasure to guide you through our today's program, which is a very special one. And uh, first of all, uh, we have a welcome note from Professor Christoph Meinl, the director of the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, who is actually currently in New York and cannot make it in person, but he recorded a video for us. And I would like to ask Steffi, who is so nice to handle all the back here, Steffi Schwertfeger, to run the video. And before you run the video, I just want a uh, short note here because you have the netiquette slide. Uh, so what we are doing here is um, a foremost a session with speakers and a panel session. So it is uh, appropriate not to switch off, to switch on your video and your microphone during the presentations. Uh, please raise your hand. Actually, use also the chat if you have questions, because we have Q&A sessions um, for sure after the first two talks. And uh, also choose between the speaker view and the gallery view. And for those of you who want to have a really nice experience with the speakers, just go to your video uh, settings and hide non-video participants that always gives you a chance to have just the speakers and all the rest are faded off if their video is switched off. So, but now we can play the welcome note from Christoph Meinl. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to our GTTA Spotlight Special. I'm happy to welcome you, Christoph Meinl, my name, I'm the head of the Hasso Plattner Institute and uh, have the chair for Internet Technologies and Systems here. This new GDTA format, the Spotlight Special, uh, is uh, focused to the uh, IEEE 7000 standards. So the global design thinking uh, association is closely connected with all of these activities, these activities to develop standards for an ethical based engineering uh, the standard uh, will be released in Europe end of the year in November 2020. And of course, the HPI Design D School and the HPI Design Thinking activities are a natural partner for such value based uh, engineering. And we are happy to have Sarah Speakerman with us. She was a promoter and a driver of the development of this standard. Uh, uh, together with others, she initiated and implemented this very important initiative. And as an Institute for Digital Engineering, we welcome very much such kind of activities. Original, uh, originally, our event was planned as a conference in New York, in the Hudson Yard, in our HPI floor. Uh, we have in the new building there. But a number of uh, you have restrictions with traveling uh, due to Corona. So we switched to have this online, this event as an online event. Sorry for that. It would be much better if we could personally interact with each other. I already welcomed Sarah Spiekermann uh, from the Wirtschaftsuniversität uh, in, in Wien as a keynote speaker, but uh, I also uh, very warmly welcome Dr. Con uh, Konstantinos Karachales, IEEE Standards Association manager who was very much uh, involved in the development of this new IEEE 7000 standard. There are more uh, colleagues from around the world, uh, Shan and Ali Hazami, which are actually designing a certification procedure for IEEE, for implementing this IEEE 7000 standard. And we have a number of colleagues from big enterprises like uh, IBM and SAP, 
uh, also from NGOs, which are involved in taking such a uh, standard and changing the uh, developers of IT systems to accept, to work, to use a standard. So I already mentioned IEEE 7000 standard uh, uh, focus on ethical based engineering and uh, this is a, a real challenge because with such new technologies particularly in the area of artificial intelligence the questions how IT systems can be designed in a way that they support uh, humans in their work that they provide really help to our social life and not disturbing uh, such things or bringing bad things. So we need fairness, we need diversity, we need all this in our society and when IT systems more and more take over the role of organizing our society form the basic for many activities in the real life, in the work, uh, in, our, uh, in our leisure time, then it's very important to reflect how we should design such uh, systems that they uh, support the uh, human values. So the Hasso Plattner Institute, the uh, HPID school, is a partner in such kind of thinking, such kind of developments. So uh, since 15 years, uh, this year we will celebrate 15 years anniversary of the uh, HPID school. Since 15 years, the uh, user and to see users and humans in the middle of uh, technological developments, in the middle of digital developments. This is a focus uh, all over all the time uh, of the uh, D school. And for that reason, uh, D school says, yes, this is a very important activity. We try to support it as uh, we can. By the way, already uh, two years ago in the uh, 2020 uh, Global Design Thinking Alliance Conference, uh, the IEEE 7000 uh, standards was a core topic, was already uh, introduced, the development were introduced and discussed, and uh, the, uh, uh, this was also the start of the discussion of such value-based design processes among uh, this association, among all the D schools, all the universities that provide uh, D programs, design thinking programs, which are uh, uh, which work together in our uh, GDTA uh, association. By the way, in the Hatze uh, Plattner Institute, we developed another approach, the Clean IT Initiative, which also uh, very much fits into this uh, uh, development and into this uh, uh, space of ethical-based engineering, uh, uh, engineering uh, activities. The idea of this Clean IT Initiative is to uh, focus the development of digital systems, of software systems, more in a sustainable way. So the uh, idea is the uh, uh, digital technologies are a very important factor to reach the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, but at the same time uh, the uh, digital technologies need a lot of energy and have today a big uh, carbon footprint. So digitalization activities uh, around the world have twice as much uh, a carbon footprint, uh, twice as big carbon footprint, like all the air traffic. So uh, also this activity, clean activity, fits into what we want to drive uh, together with the IEEE uh, 7000 standard activities. So 
uh, I am happy to open this floor to discuss uh, the relevance of uh, such value-based engineering methods, particularly for new developments in the artificial, artificial intelligence. Uh, we uh, focus on universities, education, but in the same, with the same importance to the big companies, to the big corporations, to small, up, uh, small startups which develop such technologies, NGOs that help to implement this. So to uh, strengthen the impact of such developments for our social life uh, around the world. So happy to have you here in our event and I wish you fruitful uh, discussions and interactions uh, around this topic, the ethical based engineering. So thank you very much, Christoph Meinel, actually, uh, who is currently in New York and who gave us here a warm welcome from the Hasso Plattner Institute to our spotlight special and uh, which is uh, organized as which is actually uh, a normal session uh, uh, our monthly session is the spotlight session this is a very special one and uh, as you already figured out we are recording the conference sessions here and the video summary will be available later on on the gdta website and also hopefully on the ieee and the wu websites um, and a few words about the gdta uh, we founded the gdta five years ago at the 10th anniversary of the hpid school uh, with the goal of anchoring design thinking more deeply in the international educational landscape networking innovative educational institutions intensifying the research on design thinking and further developing also the design thinking mindset globally and we do have a yearly conference, as uh, Christoph Meinl also pointed out uh, two years ago. We had a conference. We were focusing already on the IEEE standard, on ethical-based engineering. And uh, uh, this year, our yearly conference will be held embedded in the DECON Festival. That is a conference we are doing every five years now, since uh, 2012. And it will be a three-day international event on design thinking and will take place from October 12 to 14 in Cape Town, South Africa and value based ethical based engineering will for sure be a part of that conference as well. And you find more information on um, more information on our website gdta.org. But today we are meeting for a very special spotlight. That's how we call it the, why we call it the spotlight special. Um, Usually we have a 60 minute um, conference, mini conference actually with design thinking experts on the panel, um, talking about the latest research about um, new things in education and design thinking impact. And today we have a two and a half hour session, which was like Christoph Meinl was pointing out, originally planned to be held in our New York office, the HBI office, um, and uh, since so many people were saying, no, it's still pandemic and we can't travel, we thought we uh, move it to a squeezed version in the internet, an online version. So it's not a full day conference, just a two and a half hours, but that is also a long time already for, um, for the internet here, for our online experiences. And uh, I'm happy that it's, uh, that it's also not just a GDTA thing, it is actually a cooperation between IEEE and Wirtschaftsuni Wien, and I'm really happy about the cooperation which uh, started more than about two years ago, more than two years ago, we, we got in contact. And uh, but when we planned the session here today, we could not have imagined that the political situation would escalate to such an explosive ex extent as we are currently experiencing. But we did not hesitate for a second to hold the event despite the war situation in Ukraine. More than ever, it is obvious that an important, what an important role a common foundation of values plays in social coexistence. And with that, I would like to welcome our first speaker here 
for today, Konstantinos Karachalios. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you here again, Konstantinos. Please switch on your video. Um, Konstantinos is the managing director of the IEEE Standards Association. We had a, I think we had the first contact um, in 2018 through Sarah Spiekermann and Maylin Fung. So from both sides, I got, I got information. There is an interesting person we should talk. And uh, I met you as a person very concerned about the developments in AI and robotics and the usage of personal data, especially for young kids. And that was the reason why we did also a project together in 2020 in the summer with our students about age appropriate design. That was the topic. And uh, Konstantinos um, will give us the bigger picture about the IEEE 7000 standard, standard with, with which he was the person to drive it in the IEEE environment. So thanks a lot for being here, Konstantinos. Switch on your microphone, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted uh, to be to, today here virtually with you and uh, uh, our audience. And uh, there has been, uh, Chris, uh, Christian has really uh, brought uh, the major points why this is important, uh, why we're here. Uh, I would like just to say something why it is IEEE that is here today and not another organization. Well, uh, we represent uh, somehow the global techno-scientific communities, not only the field of uh, electrical engineering, as uh, you are well aware. And we, we have a huge impact and influence worldwide, not only through our standards, for instance, Wi-Fi and Ethernet, these are our standards, but more importantly, about the attitude we're creating. So we're a very uh, peer-based organization. So, and this is very serious because we create narratives about ourselves. And uh, this has a very lasting and long impact. So it is very important how we see our profession and how we deal with this. And uh, our tagline is advancing technology for humanity. And the point is, this is very ambitious because this is not really what happens. We're advancing technology, for sure. Assuming this is good for humanity. Is it? Is it always? I mean, we see a lot of uh, cases, and this is uh, probably the most of cases, that technology is not uh, produced uh, just in nihil or in vacuum. It is produced to give competitive advantage to a company against another company, to a nation against another nation. And we see this happening in real time now, what it means technological supremacy. So te uh, advanced technology is not per se good for the entire humanity, maybe good for some groups of people. Now, our ambition is to democratize this technological knowledge and also to convince our peers, ourselves, to do a better design job from the beginning. And what do I mean by this? This is not just wishful thinking. These uh, technologies that uh, we're talking here about, which are really, uh, I could say, they're very intrusive and uh, immersive for us. These technologies uh, are, and also the way they are produced and coded and so on, uh, increasingly complex. And uh, the good thing about this is uh, that the bosses, let's say, the, or the shareholders, are, they don't really know what the system architects and the coders are doing, what are the real possibilities they have. So the black box is not only a black box between uh, company X and company Y, it is a black box also hierarchically. The people really on the top don't always know what the people down there are doing. So there is a space of freedom there that opens up and a different uh, possibility of managing also. And we should really assume these uh, possibilities. Now regarding management, this is not our business in IEEE, but uh, regarding design, it is. So we thought, and we know this is the case, 
that uh, the system architects and the coders, they do not use the space of, response, uh, of freedom that they have in a good way. Most of it, they are doing terrible things. And sorry to say that, and because this is, uh, we see what is happening around us. In particular, uh, I'm not very pleased to see how they have been uh, uh, really treating our children, making them really addictive, and this on purpose, not by, let's say, by coincidence. It was on purpose. And so there is no, zero innocence there. We cannot uh, let it pass anymore. No, we're good people doing just good work and other people are screwing this up. This is not the case. We don't buy this anymore. So what needs to be done? So 7,000 is the beginning of an answer to this question. No more and no less. We thought we must give the good people there or the people who are really, uh, let's say they have this freedom, the opportunity to do a better work by better design methodology, offering them the possibility to think about what they are doing before they are doing it, before it is too late. And uh, we were very pleased when we met uh, with Sarah who had started not only thinking about this, she had published it. And uh, what she had published was half the way the standard already. We thought, why don't we make it this an open standard and uh, try to propagate through the world? And the way we do, standards it is uh, i mean in the european context standard is something that comes from above it is a kind of directive or so on not in our case in our case when we say standard it is more specifications which are developed uh, through peers it is from ourselves to ourselves uh, to do a better work and they work and nobody impose this on us we do it because it makes sense and this is the beauty of it and this is its power we are not waiting for regulators to tell us what to do. If we are convinced, then we are doing it ourselves. And of course, the regulation is helpful. The legislation is also helpful. But we should assume our part of responsibility and start working before it is too late. And also convince the policy makers, the regulators, they have to do their job too. And believe me, we are doing this too. And this works. And uh, the 7,000 is a wonderful example. It is uh, the first of our, uh, let's, the first we started uh, in this realm. And uh, it took many years to accomplish, not because of our bureaucracy, but because it took time for people to agree on the terminology, what is ethical and uh, what are the priorities. These are very difficult things. It is not about interoperability. It is about values and different people have different values, but uh, we're very pleased at the end we managed it and we have now something and uh, that uh, people can start working with. And uh, to uh, conclude here my short introduction, uh, it is a great privilege to cooperate with the Hasso Platner Institute and the Global uh, Design Thinking uh, Alliance uh, because you are the, uh, our target group. It is the designers and the people who teach in design. So this is the perfect fit eh, to start this dialogue and to see how we can introduce this type of thinking in your design thinking, because it is absolutely necessary. And uh, when we started several years ago to develop this, the question was, what are you doing there, Konstantinos? Uh, you are creating problems. I mean, you are going to slow down innovation. Where do you see the problem? Well, I believe that now this is very clear that we did the right thing. There is now an increasing demand of uh, design methodologies that take into account these, I call them contextual aspects of technology. They may be ethical, they may be transparency, it may be about reducing of bias or accountability. It is, uh, so ethical is a very broad term and uh, we mean all these things. It is not uh, telling people what is good and what is bad, we are not manichaistic. Yeah? So we did the right thing and there is definitely a demand. And I think the people who get trained uh, in these things, we have also a very interesting uh, professional advantage because it is not sufficient anymore. No, it, it's not about being sufficient. It is wrong to assume that these systems are purely technical. They are not, they are socio-technical. 
And if we do not understand this dimension, then we're going to do a very bad design and that then somebody is going to pay the price for it. And uh, right now it is uh, our children who pay the big price for it. And I think it is time we change this. Thank you, Uli, for this opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. And I would like to thank all my collaborators who are attending here today who did this work. I am not an expert. I was just supporting them to do this wonderful work. So the floor is yours again. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Konstantinos. Um, and uh, thanks uh, for, the, for the bigger picture you were giving us and, um, and also for uh, moving that uh, that I, your ideas into IEEE and make a standard and make it happen, make that make it happen that there's a standard about around that. Actually, I got the pleasure to uh, be uh, uh, witnessing uh, and a part of the European start of the um, of the IEEE standard in Vienna, which was in November last year. And it was at Zara Spiekermann's university and she was actually the host. And I'm happy that you are here um, and uh, give us the, an even deeper insight in what values mean. And I also had uh, the chance to be a part of the first value-based engineering workshop, uh, which was ever done a few weeks ago. And, uh, and Konstantinos, who was talking about, yeah, about this, uh, the, uh, uh, that he was bringing, uh, giving trouble to the developers and he's, he's reducing the innovation power. And after the three days, um, I had the feeling, no, that is not the case. Actually, value -based, a value-based think uh, mindset, which is what uh, Sacha Spiekermann, Konstantinos, and the others in the IEEE is uh, bringing to the world now is actually also, it's a is an other aspect. It's a different view on innovation and it's a highly, highly important view. And it was, for me, it was adding on the ways of innovation we were we are following since 15 years now. So I'm very happy that Sarah Spiekermann, Professor Sarah Spiekermann is here with us. Uh, she's the head of the Institute for Information Systems and Society at Vienna. University of Economics and Business, a beautiful university. I, I couldn't believe it to see that kind of architecture and to be in the, into that. And she's also the vice chair of the IEEE 7000 standard. And her first visit, I think it was 2016 or so. And when she came to, H, to HPI to visit the D school, we had the first meeting. And at that time, I didn't completely understand. I didn't understand what you were talking about. You know, And it took me some years to really get it and also to find out how important that is for the design thinking community. And uh, Zara will get us up to speed now on what value-based engineering is and the IEEE standard. Before you start, Zara, I just want to say to our participants here, collect your questions, please. And uh, you can also start uh, putting them in the chat already. We'll have also the chair of the IEEE standard, Ali Hesami. He is also here on the call. And after Zara's call talk, we'll have a Q&A session together with Konstantinos, with Zara, and also with Ali. So uh, please uh, feel free to collect your questions. And now, Zara, the stage is yours. Thanks for joining here. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and also giving me the opportunity to present uh, value-based engineering with IEEE 7000 to so many uh, global design thinking representatives and schools and people who might be interested to take this baby on and, and develop it and, and make something great out of it and help a lot of companies with the approach. Um, so the goal of uh, my talk today, I hope you are seeing my slides. Um, we do, do you, yeah? Yes. Yeah, we do. wonderful. Uh, so you see first impressions of the visual language that's developed around the approach. That's the greatest fun part. <laughs> um, yeah, my goal in today's talk is um, to show you um, how the approach works, what um, some core te te terminology is around it, and what you can expect from it, what, it, um, what benefit it produces for companies. 
and for innovation projects. Um, when we started in 2016, um, I think the, it, we started at a time where first time ethics became important around IT. Um, and um, it was um, the ethical threats associated with IT were less about, um, they were less about uh, data protection and security, which were already at, on the table at the time with the GDPR coming up. But a lot of the discussion focused around super intelligent AI that would be coming up and Elon Musk and um, Bill Gates were warning us that we really need to control AI in order to not uh, have a doomsday one day <laughs> with that technology. And um, I mean, uh, no matter to what extent you, start, you really believe in the super intelligence coming up, um, one thing is for sure, a lot of the global institutions um, got and became active. Um, the OECD, IEEE itself, but also large corporations like Microsoft and IBM um, and um, the European Commission became active in starting to think about how um, AI could be regulated um, around ethics. And um, what happened is that all of these big institutions followed a similar approach in that they formulated a number of principles that they'd want to see society and institutions and innovation projects follow. Um, principles like privacy, um, dignity, well-being, control over technology, transparent technology, technology that hasn't got any biases towards a certain people. So in an interesting article in, in Nature Machine Intelligence, some researchers found that um, by 2020, we had over 80 of these principles. Um, now, um, I, even though I think these lists of values are important, um, I don't um, think that they really give guidance to engineering on how to do a better job, because if you think about a term like dignity, how is an engineer actually taking this principle and putting it into practice, what is dignity? So, so that is a huge challenge with those lists. And then um, the thing is that these, um, the, so, so, so the, the, the people who are, have met here together, and I put a few of the pictures of the people who were the closest allies in finishing IEEE 7000. You see they are from all over the world and major experts in system engineering mostly. Um, they thought differently and they knew that we have to tackle a much deeper challenge than just putting up a few principles. We need to also think about the situation we have right now in companies the past 15 years, perhaps a little bit also through the agile form of development. We see a lot of software quality problems. We see non-transparent uh, um, um, algorithms, black boxes, um, we have um, unfair treatment of human actors, biased systems, we see hardware quality problems, the um, Boeing 737 MAX crashes were largely due to the problem of the human computer interface where the pilots didn't know what the machine was doing. Um, we see business model problems. Most of the people on the call here know about Rosanna Zubov's book on surveillance capitalism, that it is not the quality of the technology that sells anymore, that the personal, back, uh, the personal data that's collected about people at the background. We see complexity challenges because there is almost no standalone system of interest anymore these days, but any system is almost interconnected with many other processors uh, around. So um, a company faces huge challenges um, to create 
an umbrella of responsibility together with its partners. Um, we see that um, that responsibility is difficult even within one company, depending on the corporate culture. The VW case showed clearly how classical engineering departments are facing ethical challenges. Um, and finally, and last but not least, um, um, the digital world produces, has a huge CO2 footprint and has a huge issue in its supplies with rare earth um, and so on. So all of these issues are around. And if you, if you want to build um, a process model for ethical system design, which is a baseline process for any system, um, uh, how to walk um, an, an, an entrepreneur and, and, and development teams from idea to practice, then you have to take, you have to be, you, you have to think about all these issues and ensure that things are not going wrong. And that's a huge challenge. Um, um, not to speak, I forgot actually the last one, which is in the social dilemma and all those Netflix series right now where we, and, and Constantino has talked about it, where we make people addicted, um, where uh, people are rioting on Capitol Hill um, because the social networks are not designed with a view to ethics. So um, um, this is the situation where we are in. And there is another thing, 90% of startups fail. So um, we don't even have a lot of issues with digitalization and its effects and its making, but obviously the young companies that are trying to make money on it and that's trying to strive fail. And um, if you look at the, um, if, if, uh, if you look into the reasons why young companies fail, um, there are several uh, of them. Uh, some of them are um, that they can't deal with the complexity, yeah, and that complexity is also because they are not so, so systems, small systems of interest and that can then direct everything, but they are dependent on partners. Um, small systems, companies fail also because it's hard for them to motivate their staff. And why is it motiv difficult to motivate their staff? Because Often you find a, 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 an attitude in, in these companies, like Elizabeth Holmes case, Terranos is a very good one for that. Founders often take a winner takes all attitude as they pursue their personal ideas of what might work, rather than delving deeply down into what I call the dormant value potential of their stakeholders. Um, so small companies are driven by some founder who gets a lot of money these days and very quickly so, but, um, but, um, but the true value potential and what is there is not really pursued. So um, a lot of reasons why um, um, we thought value-based engineering's IEEE 7000 must tackle this, must address this. And you see already in this introduction that this goes far beyond a few value principle lists and some transparency in the system and privacy in the system, no. With, with value-based engineering using 7000, what we achieve is that we are giving meaning to organizations and their staff, meaning to startups and to young people who wanna create value with technology, building value load in technology, deeply aware of stakeholder needs and potential ethical issues, and not only going for quick money. Um, also, um, IEEE 7000 is challenging organizations to, write, to find the right partners and to build a system of interest embedded in a wider system of systems that can live up to a certain ethical responsibility. Also, um, I, by pursuing IEEE 7000, naturally, if a startup does that, it will certainly comply with the EU AI regulation that's coming up and also the Digital Markets and Service Act. All those regulations are aiming to make companies behave more ethically. And by following IEEE 7000, it's possible, it's put into their business 
model and into their processes that the system flows more in line with what people and society expect. And so there is less risk for investors also to put money into companies um, that are not uh, worth it. So now, why, how does 7,000 flow? I want to give you an, um, a, a, an overview of the various um, process stages. Um, you see here um, um, that, that 7,000 value-based engineering with 7,000 has three phases. The first one is concept and context exploration. The second is value exploration. And the third is then an ethically aligned design. And some people are asking, so what is 7,000 then in, in, in relation to what you call value-based engineering? Well, in our working group, we actually wanted to give the, you know, not only have a number 7,000, but we wanted to give the child a name. And so we call it seven, I actually do as a value, I actually 7,000, what we do there, we call it value-based engineering. And um, I have been working very hard to make the standard that has 85 pages and is not so easily accessible naturally. It's like a law, you know, it's a, it's, it's a complex text. I want to make it also accessible. And, um, and um, it, um, companies must be able to run through it smoothly with a number of forms that you can just fill in with creative workshops around, but you have a database that finally shows compliance officers who want to give a certificate for 7,000. What you've done, you know. So um, you run through these three processes that I'm going to present in a, sec in a second. And every time you, have, you finish a process activity, you fill in certain forms, and then um, you can show to compliance officers that you are certifying your system to be ethically grounded. Um, now I'm coming, I will give you a short introduction in what these three phases consist of. And, um, um, an important first phase is to prepare the grounds before you even build your system, your first, what, what design thinkers cost of first viable product, yeah? Before you can build that, you have to run through all these three phases in, in order to ensure that your first viable product is actually one that you can work upwards from or continue to put into the and develop in the market. In the first phase, preparing the grounds, um, I, would, I would want to describe it as follows. Um, at the moment, um, when you start working on a project, you, with, a, for example, with a business canvas, most of you will be acquainted with that business canvas model that you show your venture capitalist, you try to innovate anything you could do to make money with. So that's, um, that's, that's a starting point very often today. Um, now we ask what you could do to create value and not value in a monetary sense only, but value in a, in a social sense and in a human sense and in an enriching sense um, for our society. Um, the next one is what you could do with a system of interest at hand to create value, because it's important, of course, in an engineering and IEEE context, we typically don't start greenfield, but we have a system of interest, perhaps a design thinking prototype even that has come out of the first design thinking workshop. Um, so what could you do with such a system at hand to create value. And as I say that, um, I'm not talking about needs here. Yeah? Needs is a special kind of value, but there are a lot of values out there that you can cater to that people don't necessarily need, but where there is a dormant value potential. Um, then what could you do with a system of interest at hand to create value with the right partners? In the first day phase, you know already that you cannot offer something to the market by yourself. You always depend on a number of interlinked systems. 
And you need to find the right partners at the beginning, um, in also at least some of them, and screen whether the market is there for you to go to the market in an ethical way. So the right partners are being screened. And then finally, what you could do with a system at hand to create value with the right partners for the stakeholders. And that's something that the design thinking schools know very well because they have been promoting, you guys have been promoting stakeholder interaction and empathy for a long time. And that is something where value-based engineering and um, design thinking comes really together because we are deeply interested in going into the context and bringing stakeholders to the table, identifying in this first phase who should sit on the table. And to also have no fear to bring in, it's even in the standard, critical thinkers, critical NGOs, for instance, who are representing um, the people, the users or the user groups that are vital for a system to, to, be, to be not only accepted, but loved. And, um, and, and when a company, a large company, um, plans to market its products um, in a certain region, um, in Japan or in Africa, um, we are envisioning that stakeholders from those regions are also invited to the table before the product is marketed to them. Yeah, so we have, um, we, we, we look at all these considerations in the first phase. Um, and um, um, a part of that analysis and an, an, an additional part of that first phase is that we are looking at the data flows between the system of interests core. Here I have like sometimes you use a teddy bear as an example, but there can be any system of interest in this core. And then we model all the partners around and look at the data flows and look at where is personal data involved. And we look at where AI, um, external AI components are involved. And when it comes to external AI components, what the standard says is that if you are cooperating with an AI service, you should have control over, and this is, the, this is the points that are in the standard, you should have control over the quality of the data that is used in the AI system. Yeah? As you as a system of interest provider, you work with an AI partner, well, you should know what the quality of the data is that the partner uses that you want to work with. You should know about how that partner gets this data, the selection process is feeding the AI. You should know about the algorithm design, the evolution of the AI's logic. You should know whether your partner is using best available techniques. So this first phase of value-based engineering, but you don't, you, you don't even start designing the product. You have just component parts and you know what it should be going forward to, you know whether what partners are out there and you already see whether you actually have partners in your landscape that you can deliver an ethical service with. So that, that's a, that's a warm-up phase, yeah? but a pretty deep down uh, analysis um, to, to begin with. Um, so then in the next phase, second phase, um, the, I think that is a little bit the, a major heart, perhaps the heart of the standard itself, is where you try to identify the values that your system should bear, should carry, should, um, should work towards. And um, let me give you an example here. I take um, the teddy bear, not because it's such a funny, cute thing and children are involved, but finally, it's a pretty tough biometric system that is, will be heavily regulated also in the AI Act. Um, and these biometric systems um, that is perhaps representative for the ubiquitous computing idea where we see everything networked in our households. Um, now, we have... Um, what we, what we are seeking, what we are doing, what we're saying here in, in, in our standard is that children, users, yeah, users um, are entering into a kind of relationship with the products and the products like a teddy bear, they bear values. And what does that mean? I give you an example here on the right side. 
Um, a person sees an object like a teddy bear and the teddy bear itself, the object, has certain value dispositions in it. But users, children, they don't see technology or properties or dispositions that are in the system. They just play around and um, know the look and feel of the object. For instance, the children or the people playing with a teddy bear um, will perceive that suddenly the teddy bear starts to talk and has a certain humanness about it. So there is a, what we humans in the interaction with our objects perceive as certain value qualities like humanness. We don't care about the technology. The technology must work. The value dispositions, the properties in the thing, yeah, like speech recognition and speech actuators and all of that. We, we don't see it. We just see the humanness. And now the humanness though is a quality that really caters to a higher value, which is joy, yeah? And um, I, I give you that example because by giving you that example, I explain um, what the value ontology looks like that we have built into the 7,000 standard. And this is a three layered ontology, which is we have a high value, an ideal value like joy, we have value qualities like humanness that people really perceive and, and love or, or don't like. And then we have the value dispositions in the object that cater to the value qualities that enable them. And this value ontology, this wording, ideal core value, value qualities, they're called value demonstrators in the standard, value dispositions, this vocabulary is very essential because in today's discussions about values all over the place, everybody talks about values and nobody makes this distinction and this has this precision of what is really going on um, because values are happening on those three distinct layers. And I'm very proud that we have put that um, ontology in the standard. It also helps us to understand what happens when values are undermined. This is something, this is perhaps the reason why we've started all that ethical decision. And you see here on the slide an example for a negative value, um, value situation where again, a positive ideal core value security does not materialize because there are the wrong or absent value dispositions in the system. Here, you might have a lack of confidentiality. The teddy bear um, might share the data that it collects from a child with the outside world or, um, or um, might um, have a database which is not perfectly encrypted in the back end. So there is a wrong or absent value disposition in the system, which leads to a quality we perceive, which is a lack of confidentiality. And that again caters to the, or the, is the reason for the absence of a higher value called security. So you see this value ontology, which is, which is I would say, the backbone, the, the, the terminological and philosophical backbone built into the standard. Um, and um, now, um, another aspect that is unique about value based engineering with 7000 is that we do not only talk about technical values, you know, transparency that everyone talks about is a technical value. Absence from bias in an AI is a technical value. Security is a technical value. But what we, we are most or are very concerned about in value-based engineering is what, what does technology do with the people? Yeah, what does it do to, to um, why are people going on Capitol Hill? Why are they rioting? Why is there so much envy online in social networks? Why is there so much hatred, um, addiction? Yeah, so what I'm talking about here, and I guess yeah, here I have the example where, where, um, where, um, um, where we know from research that young people are developing an inflatedness about themselves if they are sometimes online. So they lack the core value of prudence. What I'm talking about here is the virtues. So um, value-based engineering is looking at what does 
um, does um, technology do to our virtues? And um, how do we identify that? And now I'm coming to um, a corner piece is that when we elicit um, the ethical implications of a system in a good sense, also good value implications as well as bad value implications. One core question is that we go back to virtue ethics and we are actually asking the stakeholders to envision what would happen if a system was rolled out at scale, yeah? And what would happen to the character of the people, to the personal characteristics of the people using the system in the long run if that system was ubiquitous? Here you see on the slide, what are the negative implications of the system for the character and or personality of direct and indirect stakeholders? That is, which virtue harms or vices could result if the system was implemented at scale? That's the virtue ethical question we use. But we don't only build the 7,000 standard on virtue ethics. We also have duty ethics and utilitarianism built into it. So we will also ask, stakeholders to envision what would be the harms and what could be the benefits of the system if it was rolled out at scale and what personal maxims or value priorities the stakeholders would absolutely want to see and protect it in the system. So these three core questions that are part of the creative workshops that we are doing with the stakeholders help us to identify um, um, a long, long list of issues. And um, in fact, when we did, um, when we did research, um, we, we, and in, in, in my um, institute, I'm very um, grateful that I have um, two PhD students, um, Katrin Wettner and Till Winkler, who have helped me to analyze amongst hundreds of students over the past um, years, um, how you know young professionals who are studying information systems but who typically have worked or work in companies for many years already how do they answer these value these ethical questions utilitarianism virtue ethics and duty ethics and what you see is while they are criticizing the product or think about the product in these ethical terms they identify a lot of issues and they have a lot of ideas on how the product could be built in a better way so that negative issues don't arise or positive issues could be fostered. So we see an increase in creativity around what the product could do well. We see a boosting of creativity and product ideas here. That is what our research shows. We see a a lot, I mean, 400, 260%, one of, as we have three case studies here that I'm presenting you the data on as a, um, a food delivery service, smart toys, telemedicine. Every time we play these three questions at the stakeholders, we see that um, many, many values are identified that are not seen if you do classical product road mapping. Um, in the case that I'm going to present um, in, uh, um, later on to you um, on the Yoma platform that we did for real with UNICEF in Africa, 56 value qualities could be identified um, as a result um, of this creative workshop. So this is about the scale you must plan for. It's a lot of values that come up in the stakeholder discussions. And um, these values need to be structured into clusters. This is what you see here on the right side. So we have a mechanism of taking this hugely unstructured data um, and then building value clusters. Um, now, um, some of these value clusters will naturally be about um, should I show things that might be undermined, like privacy, for instance. And what we see in the method is in comparison to road mapping that there are 10 times more um, issues that are seen that could go wrong. And thereby, what, um, what we achieve is that um, our stakeholders that we have tested the method with are also becoming more realistic 
in terms of whether they would invest into the system or not. So asking them these three ethical questions, um, um, and whilst at the beginning 66% would, for instance, invest in, an, in a digital toy because they think that's the future, after answering these three ethical questions, there's only a third would be willing to invest. So you see here between the left and the middle um, pie um, that, um, that investors are becoming more realistic as whether they really want to go for such a technology. But then if they are able to make suggestions on how to improve the product, to adapt the design and to work towards an ethical design, then in the end, they would say, yes, I will, in, I will in the majority, 91% would invest in the technology because they see an avenue, a technical avenue on how to address the potential negatives of a technology. So, um, so, so this investment path, if you want to, is a major reason why um, um, to convince um, venture capitalists and banks to invest in, in value-based engineering with IEEE 7000 because it leads to more realistic investment decision and shows um, a path to a more um, ethical design. But now, how do you get from so many value clusters yeah, that you found with your stakeholders? How do you come and actually find a way down into the system? So we have those clusters and um, form and, prior and and what we then do is we help companies prioritize them. We don't play and trade off values. No, we are prioritizing them. We are bringing them into an order. And as we bring them into an order, we consider several aspects. Of course, the business mission, because value-based engineering is not against companies, but it's about helping companies frame a value mission, right? So the business mission and the value mission is very closely aligned. We are taking, telling companies to look at existing CSR, corporate social responsibility principles. We are look, saying companies to look at whether there are laws, for instance, around privacy. So then perhaps the privacy cluster that might not be so, have not been prioritized as so important, moves up in the ranking because the laws are so strict about it. Or human rights principles, STG goals, you know, when there are lists out there that should be catered to or a company has committed to, then that obviously should influence the ranking of the value clusters. Okay, so once that is done, um, we go into ethically aligned design. And ethically aligned design, here the P7, the 7000 standard actually developed something completely new that perhaps was the reason why, because as we, we developed something, a construct called ethical value requirement. So from these value issues that we see and from the value clusters that we want to cater to as a company, we translate those into ethical value quality requirements. These are defined as follows, organizational or technical requirements catering to values that stakeholders and conceptual value analysis identified as relevant for the system of interest. EVRs, also ethical value requirements, are like a bridge. They are a bridge between the philosophical and stakeholder names and views, yeah, and the system requirements and system features that we need in, in, for a system design. So you, I have here on screen some examples for what ethical value requirements look like. And what the title says is what I want to stress here. A value quality, you have a, if you have a core value like privacy and you have a value quality like an informed consent that caters to privacy, an ethical value requirement would say, what is it that needs to be in place? What are the criteria that need to be fulfilled in order for an informed consent to cater to privacy? So, and you see here on the slide, 
Um, it is an EBR is very precise. It says you have to meaningfully and comprehensively describe personal data processing, truly and voluntarily obtain user processing consent, etc. So in the EBRs, you can specify context-specific value conformance criteria that a system later on has to meet. And going from and and this when you are in a project and you are formulating EBRs, and I was with Lohan, who is going to speak later in the project, I am a privacy expert. I've done research 15 years and I know the GDPR very well. It was very important to come up with the right EBRs. Um, IEEE is developing now conformance criteria for accountability and for transparency of systems. They have another standard on transparency. So these other standards and details of laws and conformance criteria can help to formulate the right EVRs. And you see here on the right side, a person. This person is really important. I haven't talked about this person, even though his picture has been coming up earlier. You see it here and you see it here. In the IEEE 7000 standard, we are promoting a new profession. And this new profession is called a value lead. We need to educate value leads. And I think the GDTA would be in a wonderful spot to educate value leads. Take all your design thinkers and educate them to become value leads because value leads are very important, not only in conducting the philosophical workshops and running companies through the three ethical questions, but also to help them formulate EVRs. They have the knowledge of that what the GDPR asks. They have the knowledge about human rights. They have the knowledge about existing conformance criteria for transparency and bias. And they help companies to then formulate EVRs based on the value qualities and core values that they prioritize for their company. So once that is done, EVRs are there, then you take the EVRs and you run them through a simple threat, through a simple risk logic that asks, how could the EBR be threatened and what are the technical and organizational controls that a company needs to use in order to mitigate the threat? This is a way that's pretty much standard in risk-based design. Um, and um, by this risk-based design, I think that if um, companies want to comply with the AI Act, well, they're in a very good position because they run through a risk-based design in order to, um, to identify their system requirements. And this is a table here, I don't go through the detail, which shows then how the EVRs are translated in the end into technical system controls. Okay, so now you have a very good, um, and, and all of this, by the way, you see here the numbers coming up, yes, um, is traced. So you can show actually also compliance by using these tables. These system requirements then go to any kind of iterative development. Ethically aligned design can be done then in an, in an agile way to, be, to develop a system. And you can also have an ethical, you see also your ethical progression as you implement and put into your product roadmap those system requirements. Okay, so this is, with this, I'm, I have actually presented you um, the method. I'm trying to move on to the next slide. And I'm now just very quickly um, telling you about what the Yoma case was about, um, because um, after me, there will be uh, Lohan Spies, the CTO of the Yoma platform, and will be, he will be interviewed by Uli Weinberg. Um, UNICEF approached me um, two and a half years ago, and they want and said, we have a problem in Africa. There are so many talented people out there somewhere in the villages, and they are never seen, and they don't get access to the job market, and e companies won't find them. Is there a possibility to build a platform to identify these young, you know, talents? Yeah. And what was the approach two years ago? 
um, uh, with the AI hype along. Oh, um, the first idea was we take um, um, a little AI um, a company and um, we pool a lot of data, mobile phone data, learning platform data, and, and a, a payment platform and others. We pool five or six huge databases from various providers. And then we have an AI um, running over all of that data about young people. And we calculate somehow magically from this database who are the talents and this is a little bit still the logic when using AI you think it's like a magic box um, but okay this is the way um, the thinking was in very very early days um, and then we worked with UNICEF um, through several um, iterations and in the end what we have created is that we saw, wow, these young people don't want their data to be, um, to be mined. They want their own data to be put out there. They want to build their CVs. They want to control their CVs. They want to show who they are in a creative way. They want to do projects that are added to their CV. And so, um, and they don't, they, they don't want to leave potentially their villages. Companies shouldn't take them out of their communities. They want to be building up a respectful situation within their region. So those things came out of the 7,000 um, um, project. And now um, um, Johan Spies is um, building this platform for uh, UNICEF. Um, I also like to tell the story because it shows that what 7,000 is doing, it's, it's shifting companies from a technological sci-fi story or you know hype cycle thing into something extremely human, extremely social, and extremely beautiful. Yeah. So, um, so there is a shift in the value mission. Yeah. That is really happening. And my last slide now to not run out of time is on how do I see the design thinking schools now entering this territory together with IEEE and together with me in value-based engineering. Now, two years ago, as Uli said, I was already present in your GDTA conference, global conference, and I had this idea, okay, you do design thinking and then it somehow goes into, um, into our process. But by now, I would, I would see it yeah, in this way. So I think design thinking is really great in the ideation phase and the ideation and the context and concept exploration phase that we have is, is, is closely aligned. Yeah? We know already that a system is there, um, um, okay? Um, but, um, and we look for values and not only for needs, but I think there is a lot of design thinking um, benefit here. And then you build first prototypes. This is a perfect system of interest for us to start with. Where we are really complementing something is through the ethical methodology, the value exploration, where, you, where we use the, 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 the philosophies and then also derive the ethical value requirements. This is where the, we see the sweet spot of value-based engineering. And then with that, we have we, we must start into agile system engineering. Now you see here the yellows, your yellows design thinkings, they also merge through value-based engineering into agile. Um, where, where I wanna say that with EVRs, we develop this, the ethical system requirements with the risk-based approach. And with that, we can build the first viable product because that first viable product will then be one where you can reliably build on and move from version to version into your technical future. But we ensure that the first viable product has a good architecture and has those things in place like the grounds that don't make it too fragile and running into all the problems that I presented at the beginning of my talk. Yeah, this is where I want to close. I thank you very much. Um, um, I want to, um, we, Uli and I have been talking with Claudia and others to think about how we might be able to roll out a training program 
value lead education is a, is a core issue here. Not only companies wanting to do value-based engineering, but also value lead education could be something where we could come together. Um, I also want to thank my team. I already mentioned some of them already. Um, yeah, and you can get more information on the approach on these two websites at the moment. And I think Uli is working on, an, on, on a site, GDTA site. This is what our discussions will hopefully uh, result in. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, I see a lot of people visiting here and listening to you. Um, and uh, please applaud to Zara. And also thanks for being precisely on time. You know, with the, now we have 15 minutes for Q and A's before we go into a little break. And for the Q and A, actually, I would love to see also to have Konstantinos switch the video on and also Ali Hassami. Ali, Ali Hassami, um, is he on there? I don't see him. Yes, he is there. Professor Ali Hassami is actually the um, innovation director at Vega Systems and um, he was the chair and technical editor of the IEEE 7000 standard. So he knows very well all about the standard and also about certification programs um, and uh, so i was checking the chat but uh, all of you who want to answer ask, ask a question please switch on your video also it's no problem um, we can all switch on the video right now if you like uh, for the next 15 minutes that might might help us uh, so uh, please raise your hand um, if you have a question or remark, um, I see a remark here from Natalie Matheson. Thank you for sharing your remarkable work. I'm excited to discuss this with the Canadian colleagues and discover how we can integrate it into the curriculum, which is actually a question we are asking ourselves as well. It's easier for us at the School of Design Thinking because we don't have a curriculum. And I thank you very much, Sarah, for also doing the, the first iteration of, the, uh, of your visualization, how to interconnect with design thinking and moving into Agile. Any question from our GDTA community members here right now? Was it so clear from Konstantinos and also from she, Zara? She, she did it uh, very, very precisely. She covered a lot, of, yeah. <laughs> a lot of key points and very detailed, but uh, still I, it's, I'm trying to digest in uh, more. So uh, I, I will wait for others to question up. So excellent, excellent talk. Thank you. I think I could imagine a question to the GDTA um, heads of schools or representatives here. Um, because um, I would like to know um, from you um, um, whether you are already, whether you have considered working with values and not just needs and whether you already have developed methods or whether you uh, seriously could imagine to embrace an approach like value-based engineering with such a standard. Is that something you could imagine doing? There's Claudia. Yeah, more as responding a responding to that. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's really that. responding to that, but also more like a foot for thought and opening the ground for the LED schools. I think from a design thinkers or design thinking perspective, um, the question of value has been implicitly built into the approach initially, because um, when we look at what we have been considering as the human centric or human centricity, uh, approach in design thinking, it always has um, its implicit understanding of we do not only want to understand uh, people better, but we'd like to understand what they're really thriving for. So the user centric approach as users and buyers of products and services was also not only about what do you need, but also why do you need that. So that value component was also initially built into it. But it kept, I would say, you know, design thinking is around with us since, I would say, two decades. Uh, for the first decade, it kept to be 
to the human part. So it was only like bringing in the value perspective from, from that. Have we been considering untapped desires, needs, and therefore values from today's and tomorrow's users, buyers of our products and services? But with us and also the GGTA, um, the design thinking uh, understanding in terms of the definition also moved along uh, and saying we no longer consider the core group we're designing for our today's and tomorrow's users slash buyers of our products and services, but it's human beings and it's also like taking a life-centered approach. So the value concept in itself implicitly got expanded um, in terms of trying to better understand whether with anything we create uh, as an innovation, we're also going to make a positive impact. But the discourse in the, I, would, I mean, even though we don't talk about the discipline here when we talk about design thinking within the design thinking community has limited itself still to that very close actor's perspective. And uh, with the value-based engineering approach that you also not only presented here, but also have been developed further, it got into that broader scope in terms of whenever we are going to be creative as a human being, as a team, as an organization, we have to think from the beginning till the end about our impact. And in order to be able to make really a um, profound assessment, we have to look into this value perspective from the, its very beginnings. And I think for, for me, um, that's kind of not only the missing piece of the puzzle, but it's really the underlying groundwork of when you really think about being creative. So therefore, I think for me, at least also, I had the chance to uh, work with you a bit throughout the last months and year in terms of also being able to attend the training to see that this is really a, an, an, a missed foundation of design thinking if you really want to create innovations with an impact, not only for companies, but also within the system. So therefore, I think, yes, uh, it does resonate a lot. And with that, I hand over to the director of the D-School in South Africa, Richard. Thanks. Thanks, Claudia. Um, Sarah, thanks so much for a, a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm actually on the steering group of, of Yoma, so it's lovely to see um, this work in practice, because I really do believe that the, the Yoma platform has been born out of originally a design thinking process that, that UNICEF went through, but also in the evolution of the ideas that emerged, and specifically um, the platform, um, having a very strong sort of value-based approach, which, which, which is wonderful to see. Um, I guess my, my question is more around um, the concept of a value and helping helping people or organizations or young startups or designers understand what is a value and what isn't a value um, and not get confused with other concepts. Because because I, I, I guess, and I'd love to hear sort of your, 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 your feedback on it, but you know what if what happens if you if you frame the value incorrectly because you don't really fully understand what a value is or isn't and you, and you sort of start off that wrong footing how, how does the rest of the process um filter out from there and i guess i'm specifically thinking also from our context in africa if you just from a language perspective you know the and even here the word design means something very different in different languages so the word value and using that and whether there's other layers that one maybe needs to look at. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's why it was so important to put a philosophical backbone into 7000. A value is not a preference. A value is not something where I say, um, this is beautiful and you tell me, no, it's not beautiful. Um, Val values are born by objects and they are brought about in qualities due to certain dispositions that an object possesses. If the object hasn't got that disposition, no value quality can arise. Um, and no higher value can constitute, actualize, materialize. Now, this language of speaking about values helps you in stakeholder processes to discern, 
a true value from a MER preference. And it also helps stakeholders when they get into conflicts and have various different, I mean, we still perceive values. So there is a subjective notion. You can only um, see, for instance, the security, and the, the confidentiality in an object if you know about the dispositions, right? So there is a difference whether an expert looks at something or whether a lay person looks at something. And only through that vocabulary, you're able to come to a closed professional um, result of value discussions. This is certainly the major strength that IEEE 7000 has in value-based engineering and that you won't find anywhere else. If I may just introduce another dimension to thinking about values. Um, the way we have articulated the standard, we are not there just to protect the values. We are there to also promote and foster values. So don't think that in the terms of 7,000 standard that this is just a uh, philosophical risk management type enterprise. And we are sitting there saying, who is going to do harm? And we are there to teach them, assist them in protecting the, if you like, the end user, the citizens from that value harm. There is a kind of a duality about our perspective that values are, can be fostered by a system that carry a value. And indeed that could extend the mission of value as a value bearer to actually be the source of positive value for the society. It's not there that somebody is trying to make an artifact and uh, hopefully get rich by ge generating that artifact and our standard is just teaching them how to decide who's going to be harmed in terms of societal or cultural or legal values that they hold and a system in protection. So we have a far more holistic perspective on value, value disposition and uh, enrichment of societal values than just mere uh, concept of detecting threats, which are aspects of the so-called security and protecting against them. Uh, that dimension is not often appreciated by people who see our standard as kind of a societal risk management. We really want to turn it on its head. It's, it's societal value fostering and enhancement and progression mechanism. On the way, we might also do some harm and we assist you to block or minimize or mitigate those harms as well. I also see uh, some in the chat, actually. I see um, some people talking about value leads and, and any further thoughts on value leads and so on. And... Uh, Yes, that's uh, that's something that I share. Also, I in fact, um, Uli Weinberg, myself, and Nic uh, Nicola, um, uh, Claudia, Claudia. Nicola, mm -hmm. have um, start sit together thinking about what should such a person be like. What does he or she needs to know? And yes, this person needs to have some system engine. Shouldn't be afraid of IT systems. Yeah, should have some knowledge there but also should have some philosophical knowledge, some understanding of values and how they can also enrich us. Also in the way that um, Ali just said, we want to build beautiful technology, yeah? Um, so that's, um, I hope that the GDTA Alliance and people, everyone here on the call um, can come up with ideas on how to build such a training because that would be wonderful to roll out uh, across the world with you. Um, it would be awesome. And I think Kenza is also now saying something as a question. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, Sarah. Um, I hope you can hear me and see me. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, Sarah, in your, in your presentation, you mentioned um, the importance, especially for startup, you know, when they, when they build up their business models, usually the startup founders uh, start with creating value for society. So the, the first idea they have is usually really good. And then they have to press that idea in a business model 
that creates financial benefits so that they get investment. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I'm still thinking you said now the investors are starting to see the value in this process and are starting to invest in value driven business models rather than financial profits driven business models, let's say. I'm not sure actually. <laughs> so I wanted to ask if you have really experienced that because from your presentation, I had the feeling, you know, the founders are, uh, um, are the ones running behind the money and, and, and building the bad business models. But all founders I have met now start with an idea that uh, offers value for society and then they have to pivot as long as that doesn't uh, uh, um, generate any financial profit because otherwise they don't get a VC investment. Yes. Um, several things here. Yes, it's true that investors come here with, a, with some great idea that they have come up with by themselves or with one or two friends. But the BBE approach helps them to challenge that idea in a very strong way. And it helps them to see a lot of positive potentials. I've done that with a telemedicine startup here in Vienna, where you see your business vision moving into another direction, but potentially one that is more worthwhile pursuing than you initially thought, first thing. Second thing, you see a complexity that Today, many people rush in, even when they get money, it takes them a year or two to realize that they won't make it. Read help them to see the complexity from the start. And the investors who are putting money into VBE, if I was an investor, I'd run a, a small company always through this process because then I know where I'm putting my money. Yeah, it's much richer than a business canvas thing. So if you can... Yeah, it, as long as you have rational investors who want to build a good storyline, this can really help. And, and I've seen it in the cases that, that we build. I don't see what, you know, um, investment is not only about the money side, it's also about the cost side. And I also don't think that the current investment way where you take 10 startups that you are funding and then nine you are counting to go bankrupt from the day one, yeah? Um, no, I deeply believe running companies through VBE, you have five companies successful, at least, at least. You don't burn the young people and your capital to that extent. This is why I would do it, yeah? We are in our break time now already, so um, I would, I would allow ourselves like five minutes of little bio break, coffee break, whatever, and uh, then meet again in five minutes here at the screen. I would love to continue the discussion here, but well, I think we have some time later as well um, uh, during the panel, the panel situation, to make that. Yeah, to make some other questions answered. Yeah, let's uh, take a break. And for those of you who want to continue talking, of course, you can talk here because the call is still open. Um, I'll take a little break here um, and uh, see you back in five minutes. Yeah. Hello. Back again here at our DDTI Spotlight Special. I hope you had a, had a relaxing five minutes here. And uh, now we, uh, we move into the second round, uh, which is, um, which we want to start. It's actually, we want to learn, learn more with, uh, with people who are already dealing with ethical issues in their environments, in their companies, organizations, and um, Sarah was proposing that we start with Lohan Spies because he was actually the first experimenter around. He got the first chance to really try it out. And Lohan, uh, first time that we are meeting today here, uh, you are in South Africa right now, is it right? That's correct. Yeah. 
thanks a lot for joining and uh, let's start maybe in a uh, with a five minute q and a session and i think sarah should be involved as well because you were uh, you and lohan you were uh, driving this together and maybe you could uh, you could assist me in answering asking questions actually uh, to um, introduce lohan lohan spies is the ceo and founder of DIDX, is I do I pronounce that right? That's correct. Yes. The Digital yeah, yeah. Identity Extraordinary. I like that term very much. Uh, and uh, DIDX focuses on self-sovereign ident identity, and is uh, they call themselves the thought leader in this space in the African continent. But uh, Lohan acts also as the CTO. Are you still that in that position of the UNICEF Yoma uh, platform, the CTO? Correct. Yeah. And so that 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 uh, when uh, when you got in touch with that kind of approach, uh, as I read, that was something um, what was it was not t totally new. It was actually something you were applauding to. You were saying, "Yo, there is something uh, which is helping me to do something different." So uh, to explain, maybe you can explain briefly how did how did you approach that? How did you? Um, what was your thinking before and how did IEEE, at least it was not released at that time when you started with doing it, uh, uh, you were actually a, a kind of doing a prototype. How, how did that help help you? So it's actually quite interesting. Um, one thing that uh, Dr. Shera, um showed on one of the slides that I didn't know is that Yoma initially started off with this idea of being a AI aggregating platform and then matching the youth to employment opportunities. Um, that's new to me, but it's very interesting. Because when I joined the, the Yoma group, um, it was during a design sprint exercise in Cape Town. And we had youth, um, about five youth from five different countries, let's say about 20, 25 youth from all over Africa um, participating in this design thinking workshop. And then um, they invited me to mutual uh, friends. I was invited to this workshop. And then one of the things that came up is um, this notion of trust and privacy. And they didn't really know how they can handle it. And I come from a self sovereign identity background, which is very much aligned with the concept of IEEE 7000 in terms of privacy and trust. And I kind of put my hand up and I said, well, I have a solution for the problem that you are facing. And that is how I became involved in the in the Yoma project is by kind of coming from a technical uh, perspective and looking at what are the values that they are busy discussing and how I can actually alleviate or to a large degree solve those um, those problems. So that was kind of my my start working with the working with the Yoma project. And when I met Dr. Shera and this whole concept of IEEE 7000 and value based engineering, it resonated very very well with me. Because my the technology from a self sovereign identity perspective is very much aligned about giving people power back, um, adhering to their values, um, adhering to privacy, adhering to trust. So for me, I had a natural alignment with what um, EVRs is all about. And what changed for me is coming from that kind of philosophy or, or, or that belief that we should have power and control over data and how we interact with systems and what we share. Um, after I went through the whole process, uh, there are quite a lot of things that then came to the fore that I didn't really thought about before. Um, and for me, that was the very interesting thing about going through this whole, um, this whole process is looking at the system from a holistic perspective but through the view or the lens of your user. And as soon as you do that, you start looking at the system in a complete different way. Because as one of the um, questions in the Q&A session is like, I think people struggle to understand how this can be beneficial from a startup perspective, because people just want to build stuff and make money as quickly as possible. But I completely agree with uh, this idea of dormant uh, value potential, because once you really start looking at the system from this perspective, there are so much value that is at today actually completely untapped because it is not part of the business model. The business model is purely to make money, regardless of ethics or morals or values. Um, so for me, it just expanded my view of system design completely in a, in a whole different paradigm. 
I'm, I, I'm thinking about things completely different after this whole episode. Yeah, I had a similar experience at the workshop with uh, Sarah. It, it, even if you are running just through a kind of um, a model uh, project, and uh, that that adds uh, for me, the, um, I I would add another question. You know, you're talking about the, the this kind of full biz business approach. Um, should we think of, or did you think of, um, kind of value based business model canvas approach? So this or business or value uh, model value model canvas. So uh, integrated uh, from the very very beginning in 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 the um, in the whole thought patterns around around this startup. Question from the other side: If you would start a new company now, would you do this with a completely different approach than before your experience with the uh, uh, UNICEF Yuma uh, platform? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, I believe that we are moving to a world where values and ethics in systems will become more important because we have seen firsthand what happens if you don't have them in your systems and what the outfall of that might be. So I believe we're moving into a world where um, people are going to be much more focused on what values do the system bring? Is the system aligned with my values and my ethics or is it completely against my values or my ethics? And we became so accustomed that um, we will always throw this card of, you know what, it gives me convenience. And I think convenience is a random card that people just throw out normally because they kind of try and justify for themselves why would they, for instance, give all their data away to a platform. Um, so for me, absolutely. And I think if you take this um, the standard and you design it into new startups, you'll actually start to identify things that are very, very valuable from a business model perspective, for instance, that you previously didn't even see, you didn't even acknowledge that it exists. So yes, absolutely. I think this is a way that in future, I think there will be a requirement from VCs, et cetera, in the long run that will say, if you can't show me how you conform to the values, et cetera, of your, of your customers, then I might not even be interested in investing. And I think it's just going to add another tick in the due diligence box from, from VCs in the future. So yeah, absolutely, I'll definitely use it again. Um, and the more you use it, the more deeper you can go into the, all the values and the ethics. So you can unpack more and unlock different things that you never knew was possible before. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. So that's a big task, uh, Zara. Now you know, uh, either with with or without Osterwalder, uh, you, you have to redesign the business model canvas significantly. I'm I'm pretty sure. So why not uh, open uh, our panel and uh, just uh, stay there, Zara, Konstantinos, Lohan. Uh, you are part of the panel as well. Uh, but uh, I would like to uh, call now Kensa. Um, Kensa and Sebastian, please uh, also open open your video so that we have the complete the complete panel here. Thanks, thanks a lot for joining. And uh, maybe we start with with Kensa. Uh, Kensa, Kensa, I see Abu, um, you are the the new director client engineering at Dach, which means uh, the German uh, speaking uh, European countries. At IBM, uh, the uh, you are the you call yourself a thought leader in AI. You were with AI uh, activities since lots of years. Uh, you are the an adv uh, advisory board member. You are a TEDx speaker. You are top forty under forty, um, and uh, you used to be until last year. You used to be the senior manager, robotics and artificial intelligence at Deutsche Telekom. And uh, we briefly talked about the whole um, issue of um, IEEE standard value-based engineering and so on. And uh, what is the current state if you are looking in at IB, in, into IBM, uh, how intense is the role that that topic plays right now? And uh, what is the view onto those standard, uh, standards like IEEE 7000, which is a front from yeah. running standard. Kensa, thanks for having for being here with us. Yes, uh, yeah, thanks Uli for inviting me. 
Um, I have to be very careful, obviously, since I only joined IBM in last November, so I can't really uh, talk uh, uh, too much, but uh, my personal view and what I have uh, witnessed in the last four months, um, I mean, IBM has been uh, uh, really engaged since, or is engaged since many years in making technology trustworthy and making it uh, building uh, uh, more value for, for society and not just building technology for the sake of technology. Uh, so this is, um, so let's say the, the, the mindset, the right mindset is there and this is why I, I joined uh, the company. Um, IBM also stepped back for some technologies that didn't work properly in the past. So uh, specifically here, I'm talking about uh, uh, facial recognition. And um, we have very high standards on uh, building AI. So trustworthy AI, and uh, we have developed tools and assets. Many of them are commercial, so they are included in the products, but many of them are also open source. So they are just there for the tech community to use. And now about my, my role specifically, uh, what, what we do with my team is we co-create with our customers, minimal viable products. And every time we have AI use cases or every time we are using machine learning, um, from the beginning, we introduce um, exercises where we also uh, talk about the trustworthiness and what do we want to achieve with this AI solution. And, and we look much further than just the, the business need uh, let's say, so we include the users and the society and the humans in general, much more in, in the discussion. Um, so we have, let's say, we have the technical tools and what we do now um, is to include more, <laughs> the, include them in the methodology, let's say. So the methodology we are using in our uh, um, uh, MVPs or our engagements with, with the customers together are based on design thinking and lean startup. So it's a, it's a mixture. It's an IBM uh, garage methodology, which is a mixture of design thinking and, and lean startups. And our design designers are trained in design thinking, obviously. And now we are training them in trustworthy AI. So really how, how to combine those two concepts and to make them part of, uh, um, of the whole exercise. And it's interesting to see how customers also react to that. So um, sometimes, I mean, it, it generally depends on the maturity uh, uh, level in AI adoption. And um, so depending where the customers stand on that maturity level, uh, if, if we say, okay, we would also like to uh, um, discuss about trustworthy AI in the first workshop. It's like, well, okay, but let's do, let's do, let's say, let, let's solve the business problem and then uh, I talk about trustworthy AI, but we want to include it. So depending on the maturity, they're already, we have the buy-in and we go for it. And if they are rather not so sure, so we put some exercises in there and at the end, they're positively surprised how that changes the solution. So here, I totally agree with, with uh, Sarah's presentation uh, earlier. When you bring this topic very early in the design, design phase of the product, um, you actually change the whole solution. And this is the right moment to do it. So this is why uh, uh, I'm really pushing that uh, uh, with the team. So that's in that stage where the ideas I have uh, are being created and, and the solutions are being created that we discuss it then, that, that is the best timing. So that, yeah, that would thanks. be my- Thanks, uh, Kenza. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I would fully agree. That is also what, what I found out in that short, short amount of time where I got the chance to dig deeper into uh, the value-based engineering approach. And uh, I, let's let's find out if Sebastian Vichorek has uh, similar experiences at SAP and he can actually, he, he can uh, he can talk uh, a little bit more uh, on a longer experience because uh, he is 11 year, years with SAP so far. Uh, he is the vice president artificial intelligence technology at SAP. He's also um, 
a part of the, um, uh, the study uh, commission of artificial intelligence of the German parliament. He's uh, consulting as an independent expert for the European Commission, and, and I guess that is also uh, in uh, AI. And uh, so I, I think, you, did you have, uh, you have some slides prepared or you just uh, want to talk or how do, you, how, do you, how, do we, how do we go? So what is your experience in, in listening to Kenza and to Zara and to Konstantinos and Lohan and uh, there's uh, Sebastian, the stage is yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. No, I didn't prepare a uh, slide. I think that uh, the uh, thanks for the the great discussion and the great presentations until now. I think it's uh, also yeah gave me a lot of uh, food for thought. I think that uh, in in my opinion is uh, it's very interesting to to hear, but I think it's also part of uh, part of uh, let's say the context of of each person and the and the the, the let's say the. Uh, the the experience and and the also the roles of uh, people where they put a uh, focus on now when we when we look at the sap perspective and i'm i'm obviously speaking with my own uh, with uh, in out of my own context i'm looking at AI ethics not just from the beginning or from the middle parts so, but what i'm what i'm trying to do and what we're trying to do at sap is to look at it throughout all stages right so what we have been doing is we have been very early in the process in uh, defining guiding principles for uh, for us as a company and what we uh, have been doing as well is that uh, we broke this guiding principles down into concrete actions that people have to uh, take care of when they're dealing with AI projects. And here, uh, AI projects means that uh, from use case identification, ideation, till uh, running and uh, running AI feature in production. There are uh, requirements that you have to fulfill. That means in the ideation phase, I think that's when we have these discussions about values, when we have the discussions about uh, certain uh, certain concepts that we need to uh, that we need to acknowledge. We are also discussing about red lines, of course. So what are the what are the things that we at SAP don't want to do at all? But then when you go further in the process, let's say you have an initial idea, you have a product, uh, you have a product idea, then you're talking about what kind of data sources do you have at hand? What do you, uh, what do, you do with this data? What is in, in what form is this data representative? Do you need, uh, do you need uh, personalized data or you, need, uh, or you can use anonymous data for, for the purpose? Then you go into production where you develop the systems around the AI algorithm. So a lot, a lot of things also happen when you're defining of how you present something to users or how you uh, how you integrate certain functionality into into your product so for example if you are creating a chatbot does this chatbot get a human name or does this chatbot get an uh, get a name like i don't know the supply chain uh, uh, support robot for example so people that are interacting with it understand it's not uh, it's not the human that they're chatting with or is this chatbot communicating in uh, only in natural language or is it also giving you choices where you can press buttons so people understand okay this is not a uh, this is not a human a human would not tell me to press yes or no buttons uh, if i uh, in case i understood it then you go into production where you basically where you have uh, from an ethical perspective requirements like you want to uh, where you want to safeguard that the context which you thought was relevant for your product is still maintained. So we're talking about uh, data drift, for example. It means w while uh, in in uh, when you built uh, your uh, your models, you looked at is the data representative of what I want to do, and you have certain assumptions about what your users are and what the data is that is then used in production. In production, you obviously need to check and verify that this is still the case. That is still uh, uh, that. Uh, the the uh, the data that you used is uh, was actually representative. So you need to do drift detection. You need to do uh, uh, you need to do things like providing uh, explainability to uh, to users. You need to uh, you need to make sure that there is uh, a certain degree of uh, transparency when it comes to or we talk about uh, local explainability or in some cases transparency about 
why why did uh, the algorithm in this moment with the input that I gave it uh, came up with uh, with a certain result and how can I request to get this analyzed by uh, by someone especially if you're not a user of the system so thinking about for example a a loan application the person who is the subject of the uh, of the interaction then is not even interacting with the system it's sitting on the other side of the table and uh, someone in a bank is putting in data and getting uh, credit loan scores for example and then uh, so in operation you also have duties that you have to fulfill and the policy that we that we have uh, defined for SAP and we have rolled out is binding for all employees so what we have to do what all SAP employee has to do who is interacting with an uh, with an AI use case is to comply with the policy and it means that in every step in every uh, phase that I uh, now describe there are certain requirements that people have to look at and that people have to document that they have been looking at it and there's an uh, there's a process on top that when there are um, let's say we call them uh, high risk use cases or risk use cases in terms of ethics like when they're uh, when they're touching ethically uh, sensitive topics then we also have a uh, review that is guided by the AI ethics steering committee where we're publishing who is member of that uh, on our external website to make sure that the policy especially in those cases that are uh, that are let's say risking or, or that are close to or have a potential to violate our uh, our global standards that we're going into a four eyes principle here and do investigation about whether the uh, principles that uh, we have been defining are applied then in practice thank thanks a lot um uh, I, I, while you were talking i i was i was thinking about the session we had two years ago uh, where your colleague Martin Fassunge was uh, was there and we had that was the time two years ago when the uh, when SAP was involved uh, in developing the corona app and uh, what we discussed at that time uh, because there was a lot of political discussions about how how to handle the data is it centralized is it decentralized and how can we make sure that that the that the data is not misused um, uh, maybe looking at looking back now two two years, um, what would you? What, how would you? Or did did at that time did uh, ethical issues play a role or uh, at the in the development phase, uh, even if it was a a very fast forward high speed development together with the Deutsche Telekom. Uh, at that time, Kensa was at the in the in the other company. <laughs> so, um, so did that play a role or uh, or was it not and the second question from my side is would it be would it have been if IEEE 7000 would have been there as a standard do you think uh, the development would would have run in a completely different direction these are uh, hard questions for me because I was not directly involved in, in building that app but what I can say is, first of all, because of the decentral nature, because there was no, uh, because there was no uh, central access to the data, there was no possibility to do any AI case on top of it, right? So, the because of uh, certain design decisions that have been taken, and I know I know that like you all probably know that from the press, there were certain design uh, design decisions that have been taken prior to uh, handing this project over to SAP and Deutsche Telekom, um, where another attempt to implement uh, uh, this, uh, this app and the, the system, the backend behind it uh, has been failing or has been stopping. So in my opinion, I think the, everybody who was part of the project, I'm, I'm sure I know some people uh, and, and uh, talk to them, I'm sure have been having a lot of considerations and have been very careful in, in what they were doing because they were under extreme uh, uh, supervision by the public. They also uh, went into reviews with uh, NGOs, looking into the code, looking into the, into the concepts whether or not the the system would have changed in in applying certain standards i cannot tell but i think that my impression at the time was that there was nearly no room for 
for defining the specs of this uh, software in a different way. I think it was the the definition of it was uh, very clear, and there was uh, little little margin and also little room for uh, for let's say going into longer discussions about changing the scope um, when the project started because it was running so late already and the public already when when it was handed over was uh, feeling that it is delayed even before we uh, we started to implement on it <laughs> yeah, yeah or yeah. maybe Kenza, you you have a different view on that <laughs> maybe Kenza, you have the telecom view on that <laughs> Um, no, unfortunately, it's the same. I was not directly involved in their development, uh, so so I I can't I can't tell. I just heard that they were following obviously the the highest standard, and and this is why also it took uh, um, a little bit longer. The, the 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 more restrictions you have, the longer it takes. <laughs> Yeah, but maybe also the, the same question to Zara, you know, uh, because Zara, you were also witnessing that kind of development, and you might have thought um there there is a especially also uh, sebastian was talking about that that uh, very important decisions were taken before uh, by by different people by by non tech people somehow by political and I, as i remember that took quite long that kind of decision process took quite a while and there was big big public discussion sarah what, did you witness that and and what was your thought on that on the well, in fact, I'm, I'm, since I'm a privacy scholar for a very long time, I was um, or I was be working with the DPAs in order to determine what the architecture should look like. But um, to bring us back to the subject of now this this meeting, I must say, as to try to bring it in perspective, is for the Corona app, you already knew that you wanted to avoid mass scale surveillance. You already knew that the privacy value was that value that was to be tackled. And when you have that already on the table, then it's not 7,000 that you must be using when you already know exactly what value it is. Um, the 7,000 value-based engineering helps companies um, to broaden their perspective on a dormant positive value potential to drive a business yeah um, or to avoid doing wrongs and then their privacy can be something um, so yeah I as in the corona app value-based engineering was not what what you would necessarily do yeah um, I'm just wondering um, before I give to Konstantinos who has an idea here is uh, for um, cancer is could you imagine? Because um, could you imagine to actually do VBE at, at 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 IBM, especially since you are saying you are running it on trust? But trust is just the trustworthiness, which is originally technically the reliability of things. For me, at least in my understanding of the word, it's only one value. What about dignity? What about all those other values? First of all, do you look at them when you refer to the term trustworthy AI? And could you imagine that value-based engineering adds something to your processes that you that you might find interesting? Uh, yeah, Sarah, I'm I'm glad to try to answer it, but maybe if they ask the 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 uh, Constantinos raise his hand, maybe if if it was directly a comment on your on your last. Uh, uh, observation. Maybe it could be uh, worth to hear Constantinos first, because that we were we would change the subject with the trustworthy AI. That's why. Yeah, yeah. you are right. you are right. Uh, thank you. Uh, th th these are two different questions, and uh, I agree with Uli and who brought this uh, into discussion because this is a very interesting study case for the future, because something that was very needed, and uh, there were failures, monumental failures across Europe. And the question is, why did so many system architects and developers fail? And it was not just the technical difficulty. It was really the difficulty to gain, uh, uh, let's say, the trust of the, of the European citizens. And uh, here, uh, Sarah made an interesting comment 
uh, that uh, once you know that you have to do it, then what went wrong there? And uh, I would like to give the floor to Ali because uh, Ali and his team, they developed precisely in record time, a system that was able to assess the quality of such contact tracking applications, uh, also with respect to their, uh, let's say, taking into account privacy considerations, but also others. And we, do, we did this because we realized this is needed. And we made it open source, we made it public, but I think nobody used because the designers, I don't know why, it was time pressure or arrogance or whatever, they thought they don't need this. Eh? And there were massive failures to the continent. And this is not something we can really repeat so easily, in my opinion. Ali, would you like to say something about it? Yes, thank you. Um, whilst we were given the task of looking at characterizing ethical properties of complex AI implementations, uh, we faced this global challenge that uh, COVID was wrecking havoc globally and there were no vaccines in sight either. So we just felt um, here is a major humanitarian uh, case. Many states from the Far East to Western Europe and USA are developing contact tracing applications and solutions and unfortunately humanity doesn't seem to be able to trust these things for some reason. So these were not that successful. Wherever you look at it, um, the proportion of the society and citizens who were expected to adopt these applications for successful uh, prevention and protection were dismally low, even in Western Europe. So we dropped everything, all of our program, Constantinos allowed us to completely digress and go into this territory of what are the ethical properties of any mitigation technology that's going to help us because that was humanity's only solution at the time. We didn't have any other universally available and accessible technology to protect the citizens against the spread of COVID. So we basically embarked spontaneously without any prior consideration or remit or planning on discovering the characteristics, ethical characteristics that would enhance public trust. Because in our view, the reason citizens uh, who were exposed to these major threats were not showing much interest and that was only technological solution over the horizon, you would have expected everyone to embrace it and jump at it as, as a means of self survival and protection. Anyway, uh, we, we spent uh, about three and a half months of hard work by a panel of very dedicated experts, weekends, evenings, you name it, and came up with a uh, major characterization of fundamental ethical values and properties that these systems should have to engender trust in the society before a government spends money on just saying, here it is, go and download it. And from tomorrow, uh, you'll be tracked and traced for your own good. That, that looked at uh, privacy, it looked at uh, aspects of accountability, and uh, looked at uh, matters of trust. And a major report was published, uh, as Constantinos mentioned, under a Creative Commons license shared globally. And we gave a, a presentation and a webinar in October 2020, uh, just to help the global community understand that technology by itself, whether it brings fortune to somebody or not, is should not be pursued independent of societal impact and trust basis. And uh, even in a very desperate situation such as ravages of COVID, society who doesn't trust where this technology is going, where the data is going, what are the sunset terms, uh, is it centralized? Who else is going to have access to their personal data? They're not going to trust it, even though it's a lifesaver. And uh, Frankly, uh, we still believe um, that is probably the kind of approach that's required 
uh, as Sarah has gone through the whole process. We didn't, uh, and uh, Uli made, a, uh, and Sarah made also a very good point. If you already know what qualities are essential to your work, we have this ethics certification program that has those qualities characterized. We have characterization of transparency, accountability, privacy as huge sets of criteria which are smart criteria. They're not checkboxes, they're not QA and audit stuff. And this is part that our initiative in COVID, which is still available um, as a Creative Commons uh, shared resource globally via IEEE website, is one such initi initiative under the ethics certification program. But it was entirely unplanned and entirely driven by circumstances. Yeah, thanks a lot for that clarification. Uh, very, very nice insights actually from 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 your side. And and it's uh, yeah, I, th I'm, I think um, I, I'm pretty sure um, that that we will, that we were losing time because at that time, you know, it, 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 because the the whole this whole thinking we are talking about here was not really broad spread at that time. So and now. It is still not broad spread. <laughs> so we have broad yeah. spread. We are still working on that. And that is a question to uh, to our representatives from large companies. Um, uh, Sarah Spiekermann, uh, Sarah was talking about the value leads. And uh, Kenza, you were talking about your activities, they were the people yeah. who are design thinking driven. And and uh, Sebastian, you are in a, in a company where also design thinking plays a large role. So what? where do you see? Are, would you state that you have this kind of value lead people already in the organization if they are they, they, they don't call themselves that way but they are doing this and if not uh, how can we train them and what kind of role could the design thinking community play there that's maybe kensa you have your microphone open start yeah. <laughs> yes yes uh, thank you okay so uh, there were many questions uh, um in the room and, and to comment something maybe, we, we do have a societal problem that people don't believe the systems anymore. People don't trust their governments anymore. And there is no difference if we're talking about Africa or Germany. And, and, and this we saw in the adoption, uh, adoption of, of uh, the Corona war. But I, I want to change the subject. Um, um, to, to your question, I mean, there are, many companies who started defining own guidelines when it comes to developing AI and SAP, uh, also Deutsche Telekom was one of the first ones and, and really putting that into the processes from, from design until uh, operations uh, through the whole life cycle. Um, so on, on, I see two movements. Uh, there is a top-down movement so from the company's headquarters, driven usually by governance or CSR departments, you name it, maybe different companies, different, different organizations, but there is a top-down movement, but there's also a bottom-up movement. So I have witnessed at Deutsche Telekom and same at IBM, many employees have uh, the will to, to, to build technology for the better, for human race. And so for me, those could be the value leads as uh, 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 Sarah said. Of course, we don't have this title yet and um, we would have to identify the people, uh, uh, let's say, and maybe create this, this profession, why not? But I see it, many people are really active and employees just you know, individually because they have these values and they want uh, to make the, the world a better place, let's say. Um, and this is really nice to see. And if we manage to get those in initiatives to put them together, you know, join forces, um, I'm sure there's much we can do and, and in, a, in, a, in a positive sense. But you need, I think you still need this combination. So you need both motions the top down and, and the bottom up. Yeah, thanks. Zara, you're, you have a comment on that. Yeah, a challenge that I see is that um, 
um, also value leads in the way we have been thinking about it in the standard and also discussed it, it's a profession. It's really something that people need to learn. We use the value, the term value a lot. We think we know what our values are. But ask anyone in your team, can you define what the value is? Can you define to me what privacy is, what trust is, what accountability is, what dignity is, what safety is, what security is? They'll be like, okay, yeah, I have a notion of what that term stands for, but they don't know really because well, working with values is really, really difficult. And it's not that's necessarily. Yeah, yeah, I think it's so, so that's a challenge I always have after studying values for so many times from an academic perspective, yeah. you know, I come from an academic perspective. So I have this, yeah, I know what's theoretically there. It's like somebody who has studied system engineering, yeah? And he meets some, uh, uh, yeah, a, a, a person who has worked his stuff in the garage and both of them have a knowledge but there is a lot out there for companies to take and i don't know how to how to you know how to i mean yeah it's it's i agree that uh a word can be interpreted uh in different ways by different people definitely um but coming back to your question earlier what we mean under trustworthy ai and this is not just a, a buzzword but it is it is really a framework so there is the transparency component in it there is the fairness the robustness the security and the privacy mm -hmm. and under each of these of these components we have also a tech solution Okay, mm -hmm. so we have a model that can detect bias in data. We have a model that can detect algorithms in data. We have a platform that when you run your AI, uh, your machine learning algorithms in a company, if, if they are connected to this platform, the platform is continuously monitoring if there's a bias that is coming back. So after you, you identified it and, and, and erased it, erase it, not 200%, of course, we know that's not possible, but... Um, so for us, this is quite technical. So if we're talking about trustworthy AI, it has a technical component. If we're talking about the philosophical component, that might, might be a broader interpretation, uh, but we have tech people. So, you know, we try to focus on, on, on a technical understanding so that we all have the same understanding. When we talk about trustworthy AI, we know exactly what, what we're talking about because we have the assets we have the tools that we can run and see uh, uh, how they work. Um, so yeah, it depends. If you have this definition, then people will have a common understanding. If we don't, then obviously each mm -hmm. person would, uh, you know, would have an interpretation uh, and, and yeah, philo philosophical discussion. I think the question that I would then ask you is what happens to dignity? Um, for instance, it's in the AI Act on the first page. It's the biggest trouble for Facebook right now. It, it undermines the dignity of a lot of the users, for instance, their mental health and things like that. Um, now you have this um, wonderful framework for trustworthiness and you have a lot of values hooked up to that. Um, but what happens if something pops up? And so many things pop up as many people use a lot of the IBM systems in your case and you haven't thought about it. Yeah. Then you are then just, you have, yeah, what happens then? How do you, how do you prepare for that? You, you have, then you have, to, you have to deal with it, Sarah. This is, this is something not new. It is, I mean, I'm, I'm a trained engineer. It is impossible to find a solution that would solve all theoretical problems and that will solve all possible uses of technology. You cannot predict how humans will react and will interact with technology. So you build, you build the tool for a certain purpose and then people use it for other purposes. And then you're surprised by yourself that people, you never have thought they could use it that way. But then you have, you have to manage the situation. So if it's something wrong, then you have to stop it. You have to correct it. You have to take it back, obviously. And but, but I don't think it is at all possible to predict all uh, uh, scenarios before you build the thing. 
I agree, um, probably, but I would like to ask Lohan at this point, who has run to very best engineering. Um, Lohan, are you still there? What is your perspective on that? My perspective on that you can or cannot not catch all the potential variations. Yeah, I mean, you, we have worked on trying to catch a lot with you. <laughs> so that's why I'm yeah. asking you. And, and um, you know, you are both from the corporate world. What do you think? Um, I agree that I don't think that you can catch everything at once. But for me, um, practically going through the process, I also don't believe that the value-based engineering process is a one off it's not like you do it once and you build a system and we're done. And I think the catch all will come in where you need to reiterate. You, you do it, you build a system, you see what the users are doing. Are there unintended consequences? Are there things that you, that you missed? And I think if you go through the process iteratively as you design the system, then at some point, sure, you will catch most. Um, and for me, at least, I don't... Value-based engineering is definitely not a one sort process. You need to work it into your design process as an iterative process consistently because things change and people will use technology in ways that you didn't intend. And um, yeah, so for me, I don't think it's a catch-all, but it is an iterative process. And through that iterative process, you will, you will catch a lot. But at the end of the day, um, people will ultimately try and break systems. People will try and use systems in unintended ways. And the only way that you will figure that out is by doing it and then seeing the results for yourself. You, it, that's something that you cannot predict. Yeah. Yeah. Sebastian, do you have a point? For, uh... Yeah, there's one thing that I would like to add to the discussion. I think, uh, and I think that's, uh, <laughs> Ken said, you can, you can comment on whether that's the same for IBM, I guess so. Um, what, what I see is that uh, many of the use cases that we're looking at at SAP, they're on a, on a level where not that many let's say ethics implications are uh, are actually present so that's why when i when i uh, this, uh, when i explained what we're doing we have for example a use case where you're matching invoices against payments right so it's an automatic process of doing line item matching so to understand what uh, what invoice has been uh, how many invoices what invoices have been paid so that uh, you can uh, file that for tax right you look at this use case obviously it's an it's a fully automated process. No, uh, if it's since it's, uh, we're in a business to business context, it's not even humans paying something to uh, to other humans, but it's uh, companies paying to other companies. It's the the risk that you're uh, you're violating or, or that you're touching. Uh, uh, certain human values is uh, very low. Then you have other cases. And where I, I talked about this, let's say what we're considering high risk cases, where, for example, we're doing um, pre screening of applicants uh, for, uh, for jobs, right? So you're applying for a job. You're uh, uh, you're adding uh, you're putting your CV in, and we're doing that also in a B two B business. So it's not about somebody applying to SAP, but somebody applying to a position that a customer of SAP has been created on a system that SAP is providing. That's the that's basically the reality. And then. Uh, you have to decide for yourself what is the right process or what is the uh, what is a meaningful hiring process that does not uh, uh, go against the uh, the let's say ethical principles that uh, we as a company have been setting up and that also our customers are uh, are relating to and I think there in my opinion it makes a lot of sense and that's where we're also as I explained we're putting a lot of effort in in order to define these processes in the right way to define the products in a in the right way because there is critical in my opinion it, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that we should not do automation in that case. So if you if you think about it, you could say, okay, we don't use AI in in cases where humans uh, where where humans are interacting, but uh, because we're afraid of discrimination, for example. But then when you think about it, where is the discrimination in automating? Uh, this process coming from the discrimination is coming from all the examples that uh, we that our systems learn from from the past. So if we're not automating it, 
the logical consequence is that it will stay like it uh, like it is. We will have this uh, this uh, uh, implicit unknown biases with uh, people going uh, going through the process. And technology is not just a threat to this uh, to this process. It's not just a threat to uh, to discriminating people, but it's also a way to making that explicit and to making that uh, transparent and to making that manageable. So it doesn't mean, in my opinion, that we should not do it. It means that we have to be very careful of what we're doing. We have to be very careful in how we're designing it. We have to be very careful of what is the what are the different roles. How are we using this? Who is then taking responsible for the decisions that are taking? Is it the, are that humans taking the responsible or not? And and so on and so forth. I'm just giving now uh, now two examples. And I think we have to when we're talking about what do we have to do in in, in looking at AI applications. In my opinion, we have to differentiate between let's say how much does it how much potential does it have to touch uh, sensitive topics and how big is the impact on individuals and maybe also uh, or probably also on on societies and that's uh, when you look into uh, into regulation that is coming up at the moment like the ai act that's basically what uh, what you see in these uh, discussions as well and that's how regulation is also is also uh, going in my opinion I think Ali, perhaps, Ali, okay, I will just be very brief. When you have a technology like this one, where human beings are screened by an AI, as such, you run into a dignity problem. That dignity problem is much larger than bias. And this is exactly where we are coming in with 7,000. We don't go with the list, you know, where somebody said bias is a thing you have to look out for. We work with you to understand what's the dignity issue with that kind of software. And then we try to help you understand whether you want to invest in this kind of technology. And if you really want to do it, how many things and aspects of dignity you have to watch out for and 80 to 90 percent will have nothing to do with bias so bias was just just to clarify yeah. that bias is just yeah, one aspect that we're uh, that we're looking at of course and i think i think you're right but on the other side and and that's maybe uh sorry you can you can answer to that as well i feel that in the discussion about ai what people tend to forget is that we have the same issues in software in general, and we actually also have the same issues, in my opinion, in every human process as well. So the the topics we're discussing about when, when you talk about dignity, right? So we obviously have a system where people are, are making themselves vulnerable by presenting themselves in a way and they get uh, uh, they get either elevated to the next stage or they get uh, rejected that's the that's a basic system that we have right and now you can say we do that on the free will of a person looking at that you can say we do that with uh, some uh, some rule based technology uh, uh, defining uh, defining what has to happen or you do it uh, ai based or you do it i don't know by uh, by uh, randomness or, or whatever, whatever you apply, there are funny uh, experiments of uh, randomly apply um, uh, 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 hiring people, for example, that uh, yield similar results. Uh, you can, uh, I, I think, some of you may uh, may be familiar with that too. So I think the 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 interesting part is that we're discussing a lot of these issues in relation to AI, and I think mm -hmm. that's important for me. I think it's it's important to to look at that, but what I, I'm uh, feeling as well is that the the idea of so that the idea of so let's not do it that with AI then is in my opinion the the wrong one. So I feel that in this discussion usually it it sounds like there are so many issues, there are so many things that uh, that uh, you can get wrong uh, with AI. You have to be very careful. It it somehow creates a a pushback for technology, which in my opinion is is problematic and that's what i was saying because the original process also has its flaws and probably nobody is uh, or or people have not been taking uh, or noticing the the issues of that process in the past as well so that's uh, that's what i'm what i'm also seeing when we're looking at this and that's why i'm saying that 
especially these high risk cases, in my opinion, of course, we're very careful and we're trying to be as thorough as possible, looking at it from all angles, looking at what are the the, the principles. And I think we can discuss about whether we're uh, we're looking at it from uh, uh, where whether the principles that we're applying are the right ones or whether we have to look at it from different angles or use different techniques. I, I think it's an it's an interesting discussion, but I think what what I also would like to to mention is that there is the alternative is not to not do it, but the alternative is then to uh, look at the uh, uh, look at non AI solutions in the same way and to assess them in the same way. Ali has his hands raised. I think uh, a quick ob observation about this debate, folks, from myself, and that is, we cannot address all ethical issues purely in design especially for mm -hmm. adaptive systems such as AI. If our classical designs with fixed transfer functions, um, we have empirical evidence and huge amount of background knowledge and experience from the past, such as safety engineering, so be it. It works exceedingly well with safety engineering. It doesn't quite work that well with security engineering, but security engineering is about the future, not about yesterday. And you can never predict the new attack vectors. You can never predict the new attack mechanisms, et cetera. So security engineering cannot be fixed by design alone. And this is question of a priori and a posteriori type perspectives that in an adaptive system where uh, due to uh, future training, uh, due to uh, creep in uh, data and emergence of bias, such as Kenza referred to, uh, we cannot say we have thought of all of those. We cannot possibly predict all the facets of future and by necessity design, as the way I see at least the context of AI as a new challenge for engineering and industry and society, frankly, is that design is a fantastically suitable but insufficient guarantor of ethical problems. Hmm. I agree, which, um, which um, is also the reason why in 7000, a result of the process is not only technical design, it's also administrative and organizational measures. EVRs can to a large part be organization and technical organization administrative measures without a technical um, next step so i'm i'm just looking at the time here and we are a little bit over the scheduled 5 30 here in germany uh, and the discussion is is quite vivid i like that very much and uh, but i see also some people are leaving because we had scheduled it until 5 30 um, and uh, i would if there is not, uh, Ali, do you have uh, you have raised your hand for another statement or no? No, no, if that's not, from the past. Sorry. If not, uh, usually I would have given everyone uh, the the voice for for a last sentence, for a last idea, for a last wish. But I think should we do that? Yes, I I think we should do that. Uh, so, what what you from your perspective would wish in terms of value-based engineering and IEEE 7000 in your organization or for the society, what would what should happen uh, pretty soon um, in, to make that come alive and get a broader uh, broader audience? Kenza, what do you think? It's a, it's a difficult question, Uli, uh, oh, actually, sorry. because I would, I would really, my wish, my wish would be that, that uh, the, 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 the whole world uh, uh, starts we need we need a new system, basically, because the, the, the system we're living in just doesn't work. So it's not only a responsibility of tech companies, you know, to think more about values in their business models. I totally agree. But uh, we need to take this broader. So investors, governments, politicians, people, um, we, we think we need to build up a new system. And I hope this that this is a tool. Uh, that could be adopted at least you know in the in the industry uh, and in the the corporate world and uh, um, hopefully if if we can show <laughs> that it is possible to change <laughs> for the better <laughs> uh, we can have the others uh, also join but uh, yeah i think it belongs really to a bigger discussion
Right, we should do that. Sebastian, any thought? Any wish? Well, I have a lot of wishes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, from uh, from my perspective, I think it 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 was an uh, it was an interesting discussion, and uh, I will uh, certainly look into the details to to see the, how that maps what uh, what we're doing at SAP. What in general I feel is that a lot of I mean it's a bit coming out of research as well. It's a bit the uh, the the feeling that I had initially when uh, Sarah when you presented was that it's a great tool, which is. Uh, which is working if you put it in the right hands, right? So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of learning curve that you need. There's a lot of upfront investment into people that are experts on it in order to uh, to work it out. And my hope would be that we somehow reduce the barrier. So because things that that are coming from from uh, academia that are coming from research, they tend to uh, they tend to have issues in getting applied when uh, when they have so high demands and, and trained people that are then uh, working on on these concepts. So maybe it's it's something that uh, that uh, can be considered. Or I, I mean, sometimes if if the world is complex, then uh, we cannot do anything about it. That's uh, that's what it is. We have to work around it. But my wish, my hope would be that we can reduce the the barrier of interaction. So that it's easier for people with uh, with little training or with less training to apply these methods to to somehow uh, to somehow get to to a place where it's uh, where it's like a uh, on, on the job training is possible or or in in uh, transitional learning is possible. Thanks. I think we 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 take that as a call to the design thinking community to lower the barriers and to help to do the translation. In a, for the tech people. Lohan, um, any wish from your side? Um, <laughs> same as Sebastian, I also have a, a lot of wishes and I completely agree with Kenza that this is a, a definitely a much broader discussion, but if I can have a wish, um, I would wish that we definitely create this professional career called value leads and that we bring in the value leads in the design process because inherently, if you go through this process, we are designing systems, like Enza mentioned, current systems are not working really. Um, and the people are starting to get a, starting to have a lot of pushback against the current systems and centralization. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. So my, my wish would really be for, for this to be adopted on a broader scale so that we can actually start from a systems design perspective, bring in the values, bring in the, the um, ethical values, et cetera, so that we can start designing systems that are not only working for a founder, per se, or a government, but are actually also working for the users. Because I think that's been the key missing piece all along. We never design systems that are actually looking and catering for the user's needs. And the result of that is obvious. I mean, we know what the result is in today's world. So for me, that would be a wish that we really take this concept and start deploying it and using it at scale. Thank you, thank you Rohan. Ali, wish from uh, your side. A short wish from me, uh, philosophically, I think we all have a societal and moral duty to help make the transition from a limited focus on shareholder value towards social value. That's, a, that's the achieving ultimate goal, if we can achieve it with design thinking or 7,000 or method, other methodologies, that is a massive transition that has to take place. That doesn't mean social value is as odds with shareholder value, but a transition is necessary. Thanks a lot, fully agree. And I see a lot of applause. Um, Konstantinos, any any wish yes. finally here? Yes, no, I, I have an optimism uh, because I, I've been meeting people really at high level within organizations, very, very known, which uh, uh, really have a lot of impact. And they understand the problem. There are more people than we think. And uh, so, but they are, 
left alone. There is not network among them. There is no, they have no tools. So they try to, to do something, but they're left alone. So what we're doing here, we may create a network which will be visible and having also tools and uh, systems and methods that can give them what they need. Because then if they ask by the shareholders or the CEO or the, or the founder, what are you doing there? You can say, this is a standard. And if we apply this standard, then uh, we can really uh, uh, getting the trust that we need from the users and so on. It is not just my ideology. And for me, this is our main target group. This is what uh, we're engaging also with policy makers, with, uh, but our main target group is these people. And this is our hope, because if they achieve to do a better job where they are and influence their peers and the people around them and beneath them, then they, they will be creating much less problems than they're creating now. Hmm? And perhaps also not only stop creating problems, but also do something good, which would be even better. Eh? But stop creating problems would be also something that we <laughs> did very urgently. So this is, uh, this is what I see, and I'm optimistic there, because there is demand there. And uh, what we're doing here together with you, Uli, and your design uh, school and so on, this is very important because we're precisely creating this network and this visibility because these people don't know that we exist and we're doing these things for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Zara, last last uh, statement. Are you still there? I, can I, <laughs> I, I really wish that um, we build value-based technologies for the future, for the better that we go away from just compliance towards building a better world. And I hope so much that value-based engineering can contribute to that. And I hope so much that the GDTA, that the G design thinking schools join into this force. Don't underestimate the challenge, but really help doing it. Thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, also for your final words, I think there is very brilliant and we got a lot of very, very positive response in the chat here. And I thank all of you for contributing. I think the live guests here on stage, Zara, Konstantinos, Ali, Kenza, Lohan, Sebastian, uh, all of you and also Christoph Meinl, who was remotely with us. And uh, I would also thank uh, Anja, Hanish and uh, Maria, Ara Maria Aragon for the design. And last but not least, uh, Steffi for getting the whole thing together here again. Um, and thanks to the Global Design Thinking Alliance community. I hope that this afternoon and uh, morning or midnight or whatever at your place was, an inspir was inspiring to all of you to really go on that path, value lead, education is something we have to focus on and um, creating uh, and, and, and enhancing actually what we are doing with design thinking. I think what we are discussing right now, that is the next step into the future. And it really helps the design thinking community to broaden the creativity field. Thanks a lot for joining the GDTA Spotlight special here, two and a half hour highly intense discussion lots of new insights uh, and uh, thanks a lot and see you all soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>